Well, hello, good afternoon, welcome. Uh, I suppose this is what they call a, a bonus briefing, really. One where you, the Great Manx public, are asking the questions to the health officials of the day and uh, hopefully an opportunity where we can uh, explore and uh, dig deep into some of the, the issues and the areas of the day and uh, drill down into some of the specific concerns and queries that you have. My name is James Davis from Isle of Man Advertising and PR and my job is to literally put the questions from you on your behalf to our guests who we'll introduce in a moment and hopefully uh, have a, a chance to, to look ahead into the long run after next week when potentially, fingers crossed, the island may well be in a position to come out of lockdown. Without further ado, let us welcome our guests. I'm delighted to be joined by the Chief Executive of the Department of Health and Social Care, Catherine, and the Director of Public Health, Dr Henrietta Hewitt. Thank you both of you for your time. Uh, no strangers to this forum, of course. Uh, our panellists are literally here to uh, answer everything and anything uh, within reason, as long as it's relevant. Uh, from uh, this afternoon, so no, no problem there. I'm told uh, Brexit, uh, the HS2 network and Liverpool's FA Cup runner out of the equation, but uh, anything other than that is, is absolutely fine. I've not long seen them. There is an element of, of some repetition in some of the questions, uh, so in a few of those I will double up rather than ask virtually the, the identical twice. But that aside, let us, let us get going. Um, and we'll start with, with Annette, if we may. She's been in touch. Uh, there's a vaccination query from her. Uh, and I'll put this to Dr Ewart to, to begin with, if I may. She says, why is the Isle of Man's vaccine rollout, in her words, so much slower than Guernsey's, an island nation with a, with a smaller population than ours? Actually, I think that's more one for Catherine, because this is an operational issue that she'll be able to speak to. I do apologise, Catherine. Thank you, thank you, James. Yeah. Um, so, um, in effect, uh, we don't we don't believe that actually um, our, our program is behind. Um, there is a there's a recognition that we started effectively an operational week later than Guernsey, um, which which may be driving some of the viewers' thinking and findings behind the, the way that they're viewing the numbers. Um, but uh, we do we absolutely in starting this program on the fourth of January, and that was the difference effectively of, of a week. Uh, I think we're, we're really referring to, and the minister has been really clear throughout that we we will catch up, for want of a better word, and I, and I actually do think that catch up will be within the next within the next week. Is, is that we actually went through a very 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 stringent process to ensure that all the paperwork was correct. Um, your listeners will be aware of the fact that actually um, we are reliant on the the UK indemnity in relation to this vaccination as on the Isle of Man, and in doing so, we didn't have all the paperwork in place um, in relation to starting this um, just before um, Christmas. So we did take the right decision to get that right, to finish that off, to finish it off completely, to ensure that not only as we do this um, in the right way clinically uh, and using the right prioritisation, but we do this well. We do this in a very structured, planned, careful way that residents feel safe. And it's equally our responsibility that this is not about a race. It's about doing it well and it's about doing it best. And it's getting all of those processes and procedures in, in place. So I just want to stress a little bit, and, and I'm hoping some of the listeners may well have seen some of the... Um, dashboard stats that we've now started to publish which we promised to do and I'm a big believer in, in transparency and openness around where we are um, the dashboard went live yesterday. It's been through quite considerable quality assurance, and I know there's been some views and thoughts already around how we might improve that and how we might publish more information. Absolutely welcome that, and, and welcome for some thoughts and views, again, from people if they want to contribute that. So, for example, we've been asked to supply, um, you know, how many deliveries we've had on Ireland, um, how many vaccinations we've got set aside. We, we will do that. That's not an issue. I'm comfortable we can do that. But just to give some feel, and these are updated every 90 minutes, so um, I, um, I'm only going to give you stats as they were as of last night, actually, but even if I look at the live dashboard now, they are different, so recognise that this is of last night. You know, we have done 4,678 vaccinations, um, 4,049 of those were firsts, and 629 of those are second doses. Um, and to give you some idea of the scale, which we've always said we're going to be doing and ramping up in line with the deliveries that we receive, um, we've got 3,000 individuals booked over the next seven days. So bear in mind, we've been going since the 4th of January and we've done 
4,678 in total, which is now actually a higher number as I speak now, but and then a 3,000 in the next seven days. It gives you a real feel for how quickly this program is developing and accelerating. There are actually 6,500 vaccinations booked beyond seven days. Um, so, so a lot underway. And actually, by my reckoning, over the next seven days, we will be um, we'll have done 7,000 vaccinations, which is more than 8% of the population. Um, so um, just in relation to people often ask me also how many vaccinations we have on Ireland. That's a common question, perfectly valid. Um, our aim is to vaccinate as quickly as we receive. We are dependent on the UK deliveries. They come once a week. Although um, it can change, and even only yesterday we received a vaccination tray of Pfizer vaccinations. That's 970, although we do actually get six vaccinations out of each vial. So that will be for 1,170 people. Um, so just to get a feel for where we are, we have one Pfizer tray in stock. Um, and so assuming 1,170 to be booked uh, and four set aside for their second dose. So they're in the deep freeze, um, they're held at that minus 70 and put aside in line with our policy around the second dosage. So um, that changes all the time. Um, it is a very movable feast. The delivery schedule does definitely move, including the volumes, although Pfizer is, is, is certainly generally more standard. Every week we tend to receive a tray. Um, and AstraZeneca, which is the second vaccination that we're currently using now, and we started in the residential care homes last week, and we're starting in the airport tomorrow. Um, we have 2,400 vaccinations on Ireland for the first dose and 2,800 on the second dose. There's a difference between the two because, as I said, this is live information and actually some of those first doses are underway in relation to the care home and the residential home. So we've got enough set aside for those that we're giving the first dose through to the second, to the second dose. We're going to use, um, again, filling that hopper and that funnel of what we're receiving on Ireland, um, um, nearly 2,000 of those, uh, you know, about 1,700 next week, uh, this, sorry, from tomorrow at the airport, um, just over 400 a day. And the rest of those trays are set aside for the residential of the care homes, which your listeners will know is absolutely one of, if not is the first priority group to receive their vaccination. So it's really important through this, and I know Henrietta will support this, is that um, in line with our policy position around JCBI and following those protocols, um, that we do ensure that we've vaccinated in order to protect those that are most vulnerable and um, those top priority groups first. So hopefully that gives you some feel for the numbers that we're holding the numbers that are coming through um, I do I'm due to get another delivery today and um, that will be a Pfizer tray and then an AstraZeneca tray and we will in line with those um, delivery schedules um, and, and book in and just to give a feel for how fluid this is and and and, and how fast we are working uh, we didn't expect a tray from Pfizer yesterday but we've um, over the next couple of days we're going to bring forward because we have now have one um, all of those that were booked in on the 15th of February week to next week um, and the 111 team are on the way with that so a uh, lot's going on and we'll continue to share that information and, and as I've talked about we'd encourage people to to look at the dashboard um, if they can and have access online to do so. Thank you very much indeed. You've actually answered uh, Catherine there about three of the, the next questions as well in, in that, so I, I do appreciate that. Um, so if I, if I don't uh, bring your question to the, the panel, please understand it's because that they have been answered in, 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 that, in that fairly uh, articulate and lengthy answer. Um, Leslie, um, just on top of that really, moving on slightly, is just querying. He says, considering the vaccine doesn't prevent individuals from catching the virus or indeed passing it on, um, he's just questioning what the advantages are, advantages are of having it. I know this has been answered before, but just for, for Leslie's purposes and anyone else interested, if you would uh, uh, give an answer to that, please. Yes. So again, between the two of us, I think Henrietta would be best to answer that from a public health perspective, if that's okay. Yes, um, I think there's some confusion in the question because it confuses what we know with what we don't know. And what we know is the results that have been published from the phase three trials that were done on these vaccines. And they measured certain things and they got results about those certain things. So that is what we know. And that is that both these vaccines 
very significantly prevent people becoming ill and more specifically seriously ill with COVID-19. What we don't know is whether it stops them being infected. These are vaccines, they do stimulate an immune response, so they do stimulate the recipient to produce both an antibody and a cellular immunity response, which targets the spike protein on the virus and clearly makes it much, 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 much less likely to cause you to be ill to any extent with COVID-19. Over the coming months, as more and more people are vaccinated and more and more long-term follow-up is available, we will begin to understand whether it stops people transmitting the virus to other people and whether it stops them becoming infected. But we don't know that yet. Thank you. Uh, m moving on, John uh, is, is trying to understand, uh, aren't we all, John? John's trying to understand where we go once the population of the Isle of Man is vaccinated in terms of, uh, he says it appears inevitable that annual vaccination may well become the, the norm f for many uh, with the attendant pressure on the health service, of course. However, he says even if it transpires that the vaccines do suppress transmission, and achieve the, the principal objective of saving lives, there'll still be a small percentage, he wonders, of vaccinated people who remain vulnerable, for whom the jab is not effective. So his question is, will the number of people who remain vulnerable, will that be low enough so as to not overwhelm our health service? The best case scenario is that we can get about 80% of the population vaccinated and protected. So in the 20%, You'll have the people that have said they don't want a vaccine for whatever reason, but non-clinical reasons, and also the people who either can't have it for a clinical reason or because of their clinical condition do not make a good response to the vaccine. And typically that would be people who are immunosuppressed. They, their immune, immune system is not able to mount that response to the, uh, the, the vaccine. So that's what we're trying to aim for, 80% really of coverage of people who can be protected. And that we will hope, but obviously we have to wait until we see what happens. Um, will enable us to reach a sort of equilibrium where the levels of the virus, the severity of the illness it causes and the pressure on the health service will all be balanceable. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, just as a supplementary to, to that, John is, is asking, will the opening of the borders ultimately to all uh, allowing potential new and harmful strains of, of the virus to enter the island negate all that's been achieved and is going to be achieved? <laughs> that is another unknown. Um, obviously, there are three variants of concern that are being talked about at the moment. One of those emerged in the UK. It looks as if it's more transmissible. There is some emerging evident evidence, which is not yet certain, that it may cause more serious illness. At the minute, it looks as if the vaccines we have are still effective against it. Then we have the other two variants. One is a South African variant, which has been detected in the UK. And that also looks as if there may be issues with immunity there, that the vaccines may not entirely work against it. And then the third one is a Brazilian variant, there have been two Brazilian variants, in fact, this is the second, the most recent, that has not yet been detected in the UK, but it has been detected in people who travelled from Brazil to Japan. And again, early, early work indicates that there may be an issue there about immunity. But all of that is currently being studied in depth um, by the vaccine manufacturers. Um, and also in other studies to look at whether people who have natural immunity because they were infected by other strains, whether that cross covers for these new strains or not. So all of that is work in progress and we don't know the answers to it yet, but it is something that is obviously of concern. I, I appreciate it. In some cases, it, it's like being asked to, uh, to predict the lottery numbers for tonight, for example. Um, I know it's not definitive, um, but is there, is there a point where an, enough of the island's population will have been vaccinated, where health chiefs, and by that I mean yourselves and, and others, can, will recommend to government that border restrictions be eased? 
Yes, I mean, as always, uh, decisions about the border are political decisions, obviously, and they are driven not only by what's happening here, but what's happening elsewhere. And in our context, the most important elsewhere is the UK, because that's obviously where, where most of our cross-border travel originates. So there are all manner of issues there. Um, obviously, back in the summer, when rates of viral infection, COVID infection across were very low or compared to where they are now. Actually, we did relax the borders a bit. We brought in the seven day test as a, a way that people could come in and have shorter self-isolation because the risks per per traveller of being infected were very much lower. The risks per traveller now are obviously unacceptably high, so we have a much tighter policy. So even without the vaccine, there are policy drivers that we follow anyway in terms of the levels of infection across. And now added to that, we have, you know, monitoring the situation regarding new variants and what we're learning about them, and also the situation regarding vaccine uptake coverage and effectiveness. And, and, and thank you. And just further to that, it is a known, um, some form of scientific modelling or a known percentage or benchmark by which you will use that to, to assess the infection rates in the UK and beyond and make that decision or certainly advise, recommend to the politicians? Well, that's simply based on the infection rate per 100,000 across and then pro ratering that to the number of people that come across the border. Um, and obviously that would change depending on border policy, whether we've opened up the borders or whether we haven't. And then from that, the number of infected persons that we based on the prevalent infection rate at the time. Thank you very much. That's that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, Solomon has, has a point here, just uh, moving slightly off topic. He wants to know how can we stop what has happened in Guernsey this last few days happening here? Simple answer, we can't. We were almost like Guernsey, um, just into the new year, as people will remember, when we had a really quite significant cluster. We're still doing the final analysis on it to really understand where it came from, but at the moment we're pretty confident it came from a travel episode, so we know how it got in. Um, Guernsey are one step further down the line of uncertainty, if you like, in that at the moment they can't link their cluster to a travel event. And that means that whereas for us, we were lucky because by the time we, we managed to identify the issue, we'd got, if you like, one line of transmission and we just had to follow that through with rigorous contact tracing and testing. For them, they've potentially got, you know, a whole range of different lines of transmission that could be going all over the place in the community. And I think probably the, the kind of the illustration for that is something like a moorland fire where you don't maybe even know it started because it started you didn't spot it it got in under the peat layers and it's actually burning its way along under the peat layers and then every so often it'll find a thin bit and it'll pop up and cause a little blaze and when you've got the widespread community transmission and you can't link it back to one chain and one travel event, then that's effectively what you've got. And that's a very difficult one to deal with. So Guernsey are doing absolutely what they should be doing. They're doing very, very widespread testing at huge levels to try and find out everywhere where this could be and then close it down through contact tracing, self-isolation and so on. But yes, there, but for the grace of God, is what we have to say on that. Any views on um, uh, another point that's been raised on travel passports? I suppose this is a political one, really. It, it looks increasingly that, that most countries will require some sort of proof ultimately for, for being negative for COVID before entry is permitted. So could travel passports become the norm, especially if you want travel insurance? It is a political one in, in a way, but it's being asked, so I, I thought I'd, I'd put it to you. Well, I think that's probably an, another one that, that I can pick up. Um, I'm not sure there whether you're talking based on a certificate of vaccination or a certificate that says you've just had a negative COVID test. I, I suspect they mean the latter. The negative COVID test. Okay, the problem with that 
that is, it's snapshot. All it means is that at the moment that you had that test, you were not shedding virus. You could already have been infected and be incubating. Um, and the test won't prove you're not. So I think the issue with those tests, insofar as they're useful, they are useful as a red light test. So if you test positive, you don't travel. But if you're negative, you travel, but it's not a guarantee to the place you're going that you aren't incubating and aren't going to proceed to be infectious and infect people once you've got there. Now, if you are talking about travel between countries which both have circulating COVID at quite high levels, then actually that's quite a benefit. You may be grateful not to get a few extra positive cases, and if you still get a few cases that weren't positive when they tested, you don't really mind um, because it won't make a huge difference to your overall situation. For us, going for elimination, it would make a huge difference. We've only got to get one person across the border who goes about their business without any self-isolation and they could spread it everywhere. Um, you know, we could be in a very bad position very quickly. Um, so that that's the issue with those tests, really. They don't guarantee that you are negative. They will tell you if you're positive, then you don't travel. But for elimination, somebody who just might be incubating, we don't, we can't take that risk. We would still have to do the self-isolation and the testing regime here and the passport or certificate wouldn't get the person out of that. Very helpful. Thank you very, thank you very much. Um, just back to the vaccine slightly, a question from John here. His question relates to the current vaccination numbers and, and, and simply ask, are you going to achieve your target, the island's target, to have everyone on the island vaccinated by September? I think he's questioning at the current rate is it really achievable? Catherine, I think, James, I, think. I might, yeah, might take that, yeah. Um, yes, we believe we will. I think it's, uh, we've always said, and it's absolutely caveated by supply, arriving as... ...comfortable with that position. May I just ask you to answer that again, because we had a, a slight... Uh, Interruption in the connection there, please, Catherine. Okay. Can you still hear me, James? We can now, yes, thank you. Yeah, so just to reaffirm, yes, absolutely, we believe that we can meet that vaccination schedule, um, subject to, to those vaccination numbers of the entire population in line with the timescales that we've set. Um, it is absolutely subject to delivery of the vaccination schedules that we're expected to receive on Ireland. Um, you know, we, we, we are dependent on those supplies and will continue to be so. Um, it does change, as I've talked about earlier, but we, we believe that we can meet that requirement. Yeah. Thank you. Interestingly, I see the UK has missed its targets on successive days, uh, actually, uh, as well. If we were outside the, the UK vaccine programme, uh, Robert asks, what, what is stopping the, the government from trying to source vaccines from from other suppliers, i.e. Russia, India, for example? Yeah, so the, the, we're, we're not in that position. We do source them entirely in line. We, we, as a government, we need to be indemnified for uh, these vaccinations. They are licensed under emergency regulations, um, which we mirror the UK position. Um, uh, and we're directly related to how the UK sources vaccinations. Um, clearly, as a very small island, we, we don't have the ability, the scale to be able to do that. Um, uh, and the indemnity and everything that sits behind it all features through that chain. Um, so our source will be through the UK. Um, we have been given those assurances in line with our percentage of the population, which is 0.13%. We are receiving those supplies as expected. Um, and again, we, we had a surprise supply this week, um, and, and it may fluctuate. Uh, we're monitoring it carefully, but we will resource up um, according to what we receive in line with the predicted delivery schedules. Thank you. Let, let's move on to Eileen, because um, thanks for your question, Eileen. Simply, she wants to know how you reach the decision to decide the order of call up for vaccines. She's asking, is it by date of birth? Is it by month? Is it alphabetically from a, a list compiled from where? I'm sure there is a, a, a foundation and a structure behind it. 
Yes, that's really um, uh, it's important to answer. Yes, so we do. We've been using um, the JCVI um, protocols, which I think have been widely uh, publicised. They are UK priorities that are set to gain. There's a huge infrastructure behind of, of clinicians, medics, scientists and professionals that have determined these priority groups. Um, we mirror those. That's a policy decision of the department uh, and we'll continue to do so in line with the science and the evidence that's coming through. So if they change, then we'll continue to review that and make those changes accordingly. So we follow those to the letter. And in doing so, you'll have heard that the key priority is to vaccinate the top two priority groups first. So ultimately, the first group is those in residential and care homes. Um, we weren't able to start those first because the Pfizer vaccine itself was, was, is, was impossible under our legislation to be able to pack down. Scotland were able to do that, but not England and um, other parts of the UK uh, and the Crown Dependency. So we have started uh, using Pfizer with the second group. Um, but as soon as AstraZeneca arrived uh, and those uh, documentation was ready, then we started with the AstraZeneca vaccine in the residential and care homes. So those so the top priority group is residential care homes and those that work in those settings. The second one then is the over 80s and frontline health and care workers. We are working on inviting, we've invited all of those, we're working on completing those. And then actually, um, as we complete those who've come forward, we then start filling that hopper of the next group through. So um, we are about to issue the over 75s letters um, towards the end of this week, and they go out in batches the same way as the over 80s do. That's not for any particular reason other than allowing 111 to cope with the volume of calls. There are um, more than 4,000 people in each of those groups, um, and, and, and all we do is the post office who issue them for us, um, they're pulled from the GP registered list and then sent to the post office and they issue them in batches of 500. It takes about 10 days to issue those letters in the over 80s and we'll take a similar number over the over 75s. But we continue to say to people, when that is the time to call. When you're invited to come forward for registration, that's the time to call 111. And we ask people to wait until they've received those letters. Just on testing, a question from Michael about the, the various COVID-19 testing processes. Um, he's wanting to know how many false positives, how many false negatives does each different testing process on the, the Isle of Man generate? I don't know if you'll have, actually have that information to hand, will you? Yes, I can, absolutely. So, and Henrietta may also want to come in as well on this an epidemiological perspective. So, our, our main platform and has been throughout um, uh, and we do believe that it's been fundamental in the success in managing our, our strategy is what we call the real real time PCR platform. It has an absolute sensitivity of 98.9 to 99.1%. Um, um, we, um, if we do pick up any fault, um, then what we do is we recheck those and they tend to be due to inadequate swabbing in all honesty, but they are less than 0.2%. Um, the way that the team have worked here and established um, has been phenomenal. They're doing um, a considerable number on a daily basis, are able to scale up, and not only the pathology team, but also the swabbing team. Um, uh, and actually, in reality, we've been really pleased with the, the array of platforms that we now have that creates resilience in the system. We're con constantly evaluating those methods and, and confident that we're providing a comprehensive um, service for the residents of the Isle of Man. I don't know if, Henrietta, if you want to come in around the epidemiological. Yes, I mean, really just to say that the test is only just shy of 100% in terms of both specificity and sensitivity. So it really is the gold standard test and that's universally acknowledged globally. Um, in terms of the false positives and the false negatives, false negative is most likely to happen either because the swab wasn't done properly, didn't get enough cells to, to process, or because the person was tested very early in infection. And although they were infected with COVID, they weren't yet shedding cells with the virus in. So that's the main reason for false negatives. And false positives, um, that would generally be, you know, a, an issue like a mix up of swabs or something of that sort. But that's not an issue that we have had any issues with here at all, fortunately. It's a very well managed process. From Brian, he's asking, in order to determine whether or not the community is, is free or otherwise, um, is free or otherwise of COVID viruses, he's asking, is testing of sewage 
being undertaken. Who would like to take that one? I'll take that one because actually it's an absolutely fascinating topic. This is wastewater testing. Um, I'll answer the precise question first and then just talk a little bit more about it. Would we do wastewater confirm that an outbreak had gone, had been completed and closed? No, we wouldn't. And this is the reason. Wastewater testing is designed to pick up virus that's been shed from the body in a number of ways, but the main way, obviously, given the nature of it, is in faeces. Um, could also be in urine, could also be skin cells that have got into the wastewater system as part of how all the waste gets generated. But those sources, all of them, are likely to continue shedding bits of dead cell and dead virus that would still be detectable quite a long time after active infection and the risk of active infection had gone. So it wouldn't really help us to say, had we closed down our outbreak, because we might go on seeing that for a long, long time. We don't actually do any wastewater testing on the island at the moment, and there are a number of reasons for that. Firstly, it's technically quite complex. Um, that may change because there is a lot of work going on to develop sort of automated platforms for doing this, which will make it a whole lot more straightforward. And also there are some unanswered issues about where in the wastewater system is the best place to do your routine monitoring and testing. There are also things that we don't know in terms of what are, what are the questions that this kind of additional surveillance would help us to answer. Now, it may be that actually wastewater surveillance is a good early warning system. So possibly it might begin to show us early signs of infection before that actually translates into symptomatic cases that present for testing. We don't know that yet. It, it could be. The other thing it could be is really just an adjunct to understanding what's going on in terms of a symptomatic outbreak potentially using geographical results from wastewater testing to say, actually, hey, you need to get over to that area and do some extra surveillance, extra testing there, because we're seeing quite a lot in the water here, but it's not coming forward in the test results. So those are the ways it may be useful, but how it will be useful and how it's best to do that, how it can be cost effective to do that, we're not clear on yet. And actually there are a lot of pilots going on across the UK to try and answer some of those questions. And some other countries are also doing similar work. Australia is one. And so we're looking at the results as they come from those places to see whether it would be a useful and a cost-effective adjunct for us here. It's something I'm sure the majority that the public wouldn't have even considered. So thank you for the, the answer. Thank you for the question. Uh, from testing to shielding, Keith is asking, given the, the virulence of the new variant and how easily it could reappear in the community, um, would you advise the elderly and the vulnerable to continue shielding for at least two weeks following their first COVID jab to allow time for a level of uh, immunity to, uh, to be built up? I think to an extent that depends on the overall context. If we're confident that we have returned to a locally COVID-free situation, um, the strength of any advice for people in the clinically very, very vulnerable group to continue shielding, the strength of that advice comes down because effectively we are not concerned that there is much that they have to shield from. This is really where we get into how people feel about things themselves, how they assess the risks to themselves and what they're going to feel comfortable with. You, the questioner is absolutely right that it takes about two weeks to develop the immunity following the first vaccination. So if people feel that they would be more comfortable to you know, continue shielding or partially shielding until that time, regardless of the level of risk on island, then that's a decision for them to make. Just a general point that's being raised here uh, before we, we, we um, move on. Um, it's not a medical question, it's not a political question either, but rightly or wrongly, do either of you sense a less tolerant, more critical, 
aggressive approach and mood amongst the public this time. And I appreciate a lot of comments on social media, far from reflects all of the public. But in some areas we see and hear, we, we, it seems to be we hear and see much less of the, the wonderful community spirit and collective effort we had last spring. Just a, just a thought, an observation from a, from a listener, a viewer. Um, but I just want to share that with you because obviously you, you both uh, hear and read a lot. Uh, you get a lot of feedback. I'm, I'm happy to take that first, James, if that would help. Um, yeah, I, at the end of the day, we concentrate on receiving feedback from a variety of different sources. The, I don't think we were in a position where we were unless there was a great deal of tolerance and understanding and support for the strategies that have been in place. We wouldn't have been able to be in that position where we've effectively backed in no community transmission if, if uh, behaviours, I suppose for want of a better word, intolerance, as you're describing, were not, were not excellent. To look across to see differences there, and and ultimately what it could look like differently. And, and I, I pay credit as I know a member, a number of the ministers doing council ministers in a way that the Alabama residents are, have behaved and have been tolerant of what the ask is. And undoubtedly, they are the key difference that's made the difference in where we are now. And that's how I would answer it. Dr. Hewitt. Not yeah, I absolutely agree. I, I personally keep off social media, but obviously I do get emails from members of the public, um, often giving their views about what they think we should or shouldn't be doing to, to manage the situation. And I think the, the key thing is that the people who email generally have a strong Muriel says, how far along the lines are we following the department's pandemic plan as referenced in the island's major incident response plan from uh, just over a year ago now? And, and when was it last updated? OK, that actually is interesting because the pandemic response plan is actually designed to be a pandemic influenza response plan and it was last updated in February 2020. It's actually held by the Department of Home Affairs, Royal Cabinet Office or the DHSC and because it's a pandemic influenza response plan a lot of it was not relevant to Covid because Obviously, in response to influenza, you expect two things that were not present at the beginning for COVID. And those two things are a vaccine against the pandemic strains, which if you don't have it initially, you expect to have pretty soon into things. And secondly, um, the need to distribute and use antivirals as treatment for the pandemic influenza. So the pandemic influenza plan has a lot that is built on those interventions and therefore does not major so much on the non-pharmaceutical interventions, the things like social distancing, gathering restrictions, um, face coverings and so on that we've had to use with COVID because at the beginning, certainly, neither vaccines nor effective treatments were an option at all. So, you know, there are some, some elements where there was transferable learning, transferable approaches, but others where there weren't. But it was actually February 2020, as luck would have it, just before all of this kicked off, um, that that plan was last uh, updated. Just before it all began. Th thank you, Dr. Ewart. I'd be interested to know your viewpoint as well, Catherine Magson. Yeah, thank you, James. Yeah, so just to add to what um, um, Henrietta said, clearly as a department in our part in playing that and clearly um, one of the lead departments in doing so, and we sit under this command structure that is part of that, that planning uh, that Henrietta's just referred to, um, clearly we as DHSC have had to have extensive plans prepared. So we've, we've, we've taken it even one step further. So we, you know, we, we've talked about how we, um, in the past, how we developed in the first lockdown or the planning that went with that, what we had to do to shut down services. And actually we then spent, because it's a 
incredibly difficult and time consuming then to pull back and reopen all those services. So it did take us quite a number of months to do so. Um, uh, and uh, we prepared those back to health and back to care documents. But as a consequence of all the work that we have done in relation to this lockdown that we've had, we've had uh, clearly a lot of the suite of those documents that would sit within those the, that escalation planning and, and pandemic planning from a COVID perspective that we've been able to enact. So PPE is one of those personal protective equipment that we use in health and care settings. So we were quite easily able to, as soon as the, the next lockdown was announced, to roll back into those. So all the plans that we've had have been developed they were obviously clearly developed at pace and we had to change a lot of them as we went along um, but we've been able to use those and we'll continue to be able to use those so we in effect in health and care we have a lot of escalation now de-escalation plans that will form part of future planning and ultimately response plans for the future that's great thanks very much indeed uh, alice has been in touch she has long covid uh, you may have heard or 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 read about her difficulties in the local media. A three-pronged approach here from her. Um, she's asking what the department's doing to treat people with, with long COVID symptoms to prevent them from becoming effectively long-term disabled. Um, has there been any training for GPs and medical staff here on diagnosing and treating long COVID? And are people with severe long COVID being classified as vulnerable for the vaccine rollout. I don't expect you to remember all three of those, but if we just start with the, the first one. Um, what's the department doing to treat people with the long COVID symptoms? So maybe I'll kick off first, and I know Henrietta may want to come in clinically. Um, so as the department, clearly we, uh, we are... Catherine, we've actually right. lost, lost you at the moment, so I'm ask you to, to, to start off again if if I may. Can you hear me? I can, can you hear me again? I, we, we can yeah. now. We can now. Thank you, James. Yeah. So as a department, we're very, very aware of, of, of these issues. There have been cases that have been flagged to us, as you would expect. We're managing them carefully at the moment with um, guidance and advice that's coming from the UK. There is some nice guidance that exists as well. Um, and um, we're developing and starting to think about what these pathways might look like. Um, we have appointed a lead clinician within DHSC to start to develop those, um, the diagnostics that go with it, the referral pathways, um, uh, and then that will come through and, do, uh, and be agreed by the department. So it's early days yet, um, um, uh, and that'll be a piece of, it is a piece of work that's already underway. At the moment, individuals are being managed in, in relation to diagnostic tests and referral pathways in line with some of the symptoms that they may be uh, feeling. I think we've 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 cut off again there, Catherine. I'm I'm sorry, we've lost Catherine for a moment. I don't know from a clinical perspective if I can bring Dr. Ewart in at this point, and hopefully then we'll we'll go back to Catherine Magson. We don't know about long COVID because we've only been able to study it over the number of months that it's been around. Um, it may be not just one diagnostic category, but several, depending on different symptoms, whether there is organ damage, whether there isn't, and so on and so forth. So it's not easy, and it's not something where one can just set up a long COVID service. Um, the best we can do really at the moment is to keep very cognizant of the work that NICE is constantly doing to keep on top of the emerging evidence base and uh, the recommendations for interventions or support and rehabilitation that flow from that. Obviously, some of the general principles for person-centred rehabilitation will apply to this as they apply to anything else. And as we learn more, um, we will be able to, you know, fine tune responses for different patients accordingly. Thank you. And, and back to uh, hopefully via cyberspace, back to Catherine. Yeah, thank you, James. So, yeah, we have agreed, um, similar to what um, then Henrietta was just talking about as trying to get across, was is that we have a lead clinician appointed to start to look at those and develop that, look at the evidence, look at the NICE guidance and determine how we might manage this in the future. So uh, I agree entirely with Henrietta and that's our approach. And, and just, just on the last point, and if you did answer it we, when it cut out, we didn't hear that, are people with, with uh, severe long, long COVID being classified as, as vulnerable for the, for the rollout process for the vaccine? James, under this, under the JCVI, there are strict um, conditions um, and priorities.
No, um, let's try again. Sorry, shall we? Sorry, Catherine. Can you hear me again? We James? can now. Got you. Got you. But not for long, it would uh, it would seem. So uh, perhaps we'll we'll come back to that question when the uh, the, the links are a, a bit clearer. Um, I have got a, a question which, while we try and sort those difficulties out, I've got a question from Chris about mask wearing, which I'll, I'll put to you, Dr Hewitt, if I may, uh, wanting to know what health conditions are exempt from wearing a mask. He can't find any guidelines on it. And uh, he, he's asking, do people with respiratory failure meet the criteria? OK, the reason they're on it is because there are actually no conditions that would be a complete contraindication to mask wearing. Respiratory conditions, if you have a respiratory condition, you are at greater risk of serious illness if you catch COVID. So you really should use a mask if you can. The British Lung Foundation actually has some very good guidance on this. If you Google British, Heart Fa British Lung Foundation face coverings, you will get an excellent set of resources. It's very clear the way they set it out. They make it very clear that wearing a face covering or mask of any type does not deprive you of oxygen, neither does it cause a buildup of carbon dioxide. So if you possibly can wear a face covering, you should. And if you've got an underlying condition like a respiratory condition or a heart condition, diabetes or any of the other things that make you clinically vulnerable, you really should, if you can, wear a face covering. And the British Lung Foundation's pages will actually give you guidance to help you do that. Some people have however, find it actually very anxiety provoking um, to have a face covering. That may be because as they perceive it, it affects the way they can breathe, or it may be because they have something else going on, like a post-traumatic stress disorder, where anything on their face is actually a trigger for very, very severe anxiety. And that sort of thing is an absolutely bona fide reason for not wearing a face covering. So I think the issue there is it's not possible to say there is a definitive list of conditions that mean if you have that condition, you should not wear a face covering. That is not the case. The general rule is if you possibly can wear a face covering, you should. If you have an underlying condition, if you possibly can, you definitely should. And the British Lung Foundation and I think probably British Heart Foundation and others have very good guidance that will give you tips and, you know, things that you can do to help you feel more comfortable with a face covering. But at the end of the day, if you feel you absolutely can't and the distress it's causing you is just too great, then you do not need to wear one. The British Lung Foundation does actually have some sort of resources online that you can download for example onto your phone which will say you know i do not wear a face covering because you know i can't um i forget exactly what the wording is so if anybody feels you know uncomfortable at risk of being challenged then if you want to download something like that onto your phone and just show it to people that's absolutely fine i think minister ashford has actually done a very good job of repeatedly saying please don't stigmatize people who don't wear face coverings because they probably have a very good reason for not doing so. Um, so that, that's it, really. There is no hard and fast list of conditions, but some people, for a variety of reasons, may just find it impossible to, to use a face covering. Interestingly, if no one has studied the effects of, of long-term mask wearing and the, the risks, have there been any studies which show whether social distancing actually works or how effective it is? Do, do you know, just out of interest? Yes. Now, this is very, very interesting because if you try and do single intervention studies, it's damn difficult. It's difficult enough to try and do randomised controlled trials where the intervention is swallow one tablet once a day. Even when you're trying to get people to do that, they don't do it. They forget to take it. They take two on one day and then no more for a week. And that's under trial conditions when people are really, really motivated and they really, really want to do it. You can imagine that trying to set up trial conditions to investigate a behavioural intervention is virtually impossible. However, there are studies and lots of them, and as with any studies actually, some will show it's the best thing since sliced bread, another will show it's absolute rubbish, and then there'll be loads of others that cluster in the middle of that. So you have to do what we call systematic review and meta-analysis 
to actually get an overview and an analysis of the whole pooled data, if you like, rather than doing what a lot of people do. And I get these in my email box, oh, at least every week, if not every day, people cherry picking a particular study and saying, this study shows X is rubbish. You shouldn't be doing it. You shouldn't be recommending it. Um, and actually, you know, you cannot draw conclusions from one study. Even if it appears to be a gold standard quality study, there will still be limitations to it. And as I say, when you're looking at anything that is a behavioral intervention, the issues about getting a quality study are even greater. Um, and in fact, when you're looking at transmission of a virus, you're not only looking at behavior, you're looking at behaviors against the context of the background level of virus that was there in the first place. I think what we do know is that respiratory viruses overwhelmingly pass by droplet spread from person to person. So the bottom line is, if you do not mix with anybody else, you will neither catch nor transmit the virus. But obviously, we can't live like that. We do know that there is no single silver bullet intervention. Rather, we've got what is usually described as a Swiss cheese model, um, which is lots of slices of cheese. Each slice represents a different intervention. So one slice would be social distancing. One slice would be face coverings. One slice would be reduced numbers at gatherings, et cetera, et cetera. And all of those, if you line them up, you get the Swiss cheese thing where there is no straight line through that the virus can go through. There are bits where the virus is going to fall off each time. So we need to be doing all of those things all of the time. And that is difficult when it comes down to behaviour. But that is really the bottom line on this if we want to reduce the transmission of a respiratory virus. virus. Thank you. I do like the Swiss cheese analogy. Very, very, very helpful. Thank you. Um, third time, lucky fingers crossed. Yeah, uh, back to Catherine Magson. People severe long COVID, are they being classified as vulnerable for vaccine rollout? So we get a quick answer so we don't lose signal. Um, so effectively, we're starting the over 75s at the end of this week, inviting those, as we said, please wait till you have your letter before calling. And the next week after that will be those that are under the JCBI priorities vulnerable. There is a distinct list and the GP will decide. We're asking them to start gathering that information at the moment. Then they will um, advise us and we'll issue those letters accordingly. Thank you. And, and we are virtually out of time, but I just want to put one more point to you, um, Ms. Magson, if I may. Quite rightly, we, we've been COVID focused for, for many months now. Um, but Rob says this has been at the expense of, of, of particularly cancer testing treatment. It will sadly result, of course, it has already in cases not being identified quickly enough and poorer outcomes for those who miss treatments. He's asking, how is the department addressing what is, is clearly um, part of the hidden costs of this pandemic? Mm. Uh, uh, excellent question, and, and one I'm sure that will be down to uh, many studies around the world in reality of the impact of COVID and long-term impact of the COVID. I think we should start from the concept of we're extremely lucky on the island, of, and we've talked about earlier on in this session actually about where we are. That has allowed us, in effect, to keep the majority of our services open for, for, for pretty much now for over six months since the first lockdown. We were, we've continued throughout the second lockdown to keep as much business as usual as we can. There's been a slight reduction in footfall. But our main change, actually, in this last lockdown, which we're very conscious of, is the elective programme, and that's the inpatient elective programme. We did continue to keep uh, day cases open, um, and it really was to protect that capacity that I think you referred to earlier in case that we did spike uh, and we had pressures on the health and care system. I'm pleased to say that we're actually reopening the elective capacity um, this week, um, the inpatient elective capacity, uh, and our focus, um, and even behind the scenes, despite everything else with COVID, is start to really to think about how do we continue to do that work that we wanted to do almost 12 months ago, to re-transform and uh, transform and deliver new pathways, the shift of care in the community, and everything out that the Sir Jonathan Michaels report is about. The foot is very, very firmly on the gas there. There's some really exciting times ahead. And we're going to learn from some of the things that come out of COVID. So technology is a really good example. How do we continue to keep, for those that it suits and where it's clinically appropriate, virtual consultations alive and maximise the use of what is scarce resource? Um, but at the same time, transform many of those pathways and deliver 
delivery mechanisms that we're trying to get right for, for, for patients uh, and putting care at the centre um, uh, and at the heart of everything that we do. So, yes, absolutely recognise it. We have got a huge programme and agenda here to follow around transformation. It's not forgotten. It's absolutely been behind the scenes. Um, and we're working on rolling out as much as we can, as fast as we can. But we should recognise that this is a long-term journey. This is going to take a considerable number of years to make the changes that are described in that report. There are 26 recommendations, and some of them are imminent in relation to the establishment of Manx Care. Some of them are more longer term and will be a gradual process, for example, uh, the digital strategy, the informatic strategy. But if we, if we take particular areas of concern, so cancer that was raised in your question, We've seen a huge growth in, in, in referrals into the breast service. So we've put on extra clinics over these weekends to try and catch up. Um, and we'll continue to be fleet of foot and move in that way as best as we can to make sure that we're keeping uh, residents as safe as we can um, as we develop these future pathways as we move forward. Listen, th thank you both. Uh, we are out of time, but I really appreciate a real insight into some, some areas here and uh, perhaps uh, areas where we, we'd normally not have the opportunity to drill down into some specific points and issues. So, so thank you for that. And, and hopefully we've, we've had a chance to explore some of those today. Uh, I say there may be another chance. In many ways, I hope there isn't because that means hopefully we're, we're on the right path. But uh, certainly if we do do one of these again, there's, there's other issues to, to follow up already. I, I know that we've got to most of the questions. So, so thank you for submitting the questions questions. It very much is appreciated, a real insight into those areas, as I, I'm sure you agree. Uh, James has been in touch uh, asking, uh, and this isn't a question for either of you panellists, by the way, presumably the car park charges will be waived at the airport in Chester Street so people can receive their jabs. Well, it's out here now. I'm sure the, uh, the politicians will. Uh, in fact, Catherine Magson is nodding here. So, Catherine? That is correct. They will be waiting for your vaccination appointments, yes. Lovely, excellent. Thank you both. Uh, the uh, Chief Executive of the Department of Health and Social Care, Catherine Mags, and the Director of Public Health, Dr Henrietta Ewart, and all of you who have submitted questions. Uh, thank you for your time in doing so. Thank you for your expertise this afternoon. And uh, I think until next time, goodbye. <laughs>